Hello everybody. In this episode, we are talking about the acquisition of Credit Suisse by UBS. In a shotgun merger engineered by Swiss authorities and announced on Sunday, UBS will buy rival Swiss bank Credit Suisse for more than $3 billion and assume up to $5.4 billion in losses. UBS has agreed to buy Credit Suisse in this historic government-brokered deal aimed at containing a crisis of confidence that had really started to spread across global financial markets. Now, the press conference finished here. The chairman of Credit Suisse, UBS, the Swiss finance minister, but also the SNB president, were all here and the Swiss government saying many, many times, this is a corporate solution. In a typical corporate merger or acquisition, it takes about 6 to 12 months to complete the entire deal. And in this situation, the deal was completed in less than 48 hours. That is because the government itself was brokering the entire deal, the Swiss government. In this video, we are going to analyze what situations were happening before the entire deal was about to go through. Number two, what are the mechanics of the deal? And number three, what are some takeaways for you and me? So let's get started with what the government's thought process was before the deal even kicked off. Switzerland's regulator Finma said that there was a risk that Credit Suisse could have become illiquid even if it remained solvent and it was necessary for the authorities to take action. So the government was pretty clear that they had to take action. But there are two words over here that we need to understand to get to the core of the problem. That is liquidity and solvency. And let's understand that using a simple example. Imagine there are 1000 customers who are depositing 10 lakhs each in HDFC. So HDFC has a total cash of 100 crores and this 100 crores HDFC will then go ahead and issue as loans or it would invest somewhere so on and so forth. And in the process HDFC will say some customers might come back and ask for their money at any point in time. So let me just keep 10 crores with myself and remaining 90 crores will be issued as loans whatever. However, if there are more than 100 customers coming at the same time and asking for their money, then HDFC can't pay them back. That is the problem. In the long run, HDFC can pay back every single person. But in the short run, more than 100 customers come back, HDFC will be facing a problem. The short term problem of not being able to pay the depositors is called as a liquidity issue and HDFC would be considered illiquid. And even in the long run, if HDFC is not able to pay back to the customers, could be any reason that hey, a lot of people are now not paying back their loans. In that situation, if HDFC is not even able to pay back the depositors in the long run as well, it is called as a solvency issue. Insolvent bank. I hope you understand the difference. The ability to not pay back in the short term is called as liquidity issue and the ability to not pay back in the long term is called as a solvency issue. The government believed that the case with Credit Suisse is clearly a liquidity issue because Credit Suisse has taken money from the depositors and they have invested, they have given out loans. So they cannot potentially come back and give that money if all the depositors come back at the same time. And to imagine there were at least $10 billion worth of deposits every single day in Credit Suisse over the last five days. So a total of $50 billion were withdrawn from the system. So you can imagine the liquidity crunch that Credit Suisse was facing. And so the government had to intervene. Now, what are the options with government? It had three options. Number one, let people continue to take out the money. And at some point or the other, Credit Suisse will say, I don't have any more money left. I have liquidity crisis. So the government will come out and say, we are bailing out the bank. And what does that bailout mean in terms of bankruptcy? That the government will come up and either take equity, either take, buy some shares and inject some liquidity or through some other part of ownership. That bankruptcy situation is really bad for the economy right now. It will send negative signals around the world. And government did not want that to happen. Not just the Swiss government, no other government, no other regulators around the world wanted that situation to happen. Now, what is the second option in front of the government? Straight up, go ahead, acquire the bank by itself and make it a nationalized bank like SBI. The problem in that situation, number one, in a capitalistic society, you don't want to convert a profit making institution like a bank into a government institution. Number two, 
Credit Suisse to start off is a loss making company and if the government is acquiring this bank, it is very obvious that the taxpayers would have to bear the entire brunt of the situation. Again, not a popular move. And the third issue with nationalization is that the banks in general make profit by taking risks and by investing in risky bets. If the government is going and taking these risky bets, if none of these come together, then again, the common taxpayer has to bear the entire brunt, which is not a popular move. So this was still an option, but not the best option in front of the government. The third option, however, was where they go ahead and find a buyer who can absorb Credit Suisse. In the Swiss banking system, UBS is the number one bank and Credit Suisse, of course, was the number two bank. So UBS can absorb and that's the reason why government proposed UBS to go ahead and acquire Credit Suisse. Unfortunately, UBS was not interested in the first stance. The reason simple. Number one, it's a loss making company. Nobody wants to absorb a loss making company. And number two, a little more intricate detail is that UBS and Credit Suisse are not in a position where they can strategically align together and move forward. Why is that? If you look at the 2022 revenue numbers for UBS, very clearly, 64% of the overall revenues were coming from wealth and asset management divisions. 25% from investment banking and 11% from corporate banking. And UBS was very clear that wealth management is a stable income source. So we want to move towards wealth management and investment banking is something we don't want to continue too much with. On the other hand, if you look at Credit Suisse, 2022 revenue numbers, 40% of it was coming from wealth and asset management and 30% of it was coming from investment banking. So there is not a real fit because if UBS were to go ahead and acquire Credit Suisse, they are taking 30% of their portfolio, which is in investment banking, which they don't want to continue with. So it's not only about a loss making company, but it is also about not having a strategic fit. And finally, of course, we know that Credit Suisse was involved in a lot of financial scandals and the general sentiment itself was negative towards Credit Suisse. However, the government pushed very hard and said that, why don't you give an offer? UBS came up with the offer. The first offer was $1 billion, which was deemed too low. Then subsequently, they increased the offer to 2 billion. And finally, the offer came at 3.25 billion and everybody agreed and closed the deal. The important thing over here is government said that we will be supporting UBS at multiple levels. Now, to start off with and understand the deal mechanics, $3.25 billion mean that every shareholder of Credit Suisse would be receiving 0.76 Swiss francs. And as of the trading session prior to this entire deal was announced, the share price was 1.86 Swiss francs. So the drop off from 1.86 to 0.86 was roughly 60%. The second thing was also regarding the bondholders. The additional tier one bondholders, additional tier one bonds are considered to be the riskiest bonds and also they reward more. The government and UBS have released their combined press statement and mentioned that the overall value of these AT1 bonds, additional tier one bonds would be considered to be zero. There were $17 billion worth of investments through 81 bonds and this entire thing was written off, wiped out to zero. So you can see both shareholders have lost 60% of their money and the bondholders lost 100% of their money, the riskiest bondholders, 81. There were other bondholders and they were absorbed into UBS. So no problems over there. The bank and the government also mentioned that, hey, the government is ready to inject additional $100 billion of cash into UBS if the liquidity problem for Credit Suisse is continuing. The government also mentioned that if the losses from Credit Suisse will continue over the next few years, we will be paying roughly $9 billion to fill up these losses. Well, in the entire loss scenario, the first $5 billion were to be assumed by UBS and then on top of that $9 billion would be taken over by the government. So you can see end of the day, there were a lot of numbers thrown around. But the important point that you need to remember is bondholders completely got wiped away, specifically the riskiest bondholders. Shareholders lost 60% of the value and government is supporting all out UBS. So this was where the deal was concluded. Now, what are the takeaways for you and me from this entire scenario? 
to start off with the negative sentiment with respect to credit Suisse is not something which started the week before or even before that almost from the last five to six years credit Suisse has been involved in one or another problem there were financial scandals there were issues with the CEOs, so on and so forth. There are very specific reasons that Credit Suisse is finding itself in this position. You may remember the Greensill scandal, it was caught up in that. There were big issues over uh, Mozambique, its investments there. Uh, it was also convicted in uh, last year, in the summer of last year, of failing to prevent money laundering. It unveiled a big turnaround plan. It announced a $4 billion loss uh, last year. Speculation clearly over its financial health, whether it could meet those repayments, whether it could meet those loans and all this led to some kind of fines the regulators were imposing fines on credit Suisse 100 million dollar 200 million dollar 300 million dollar so on and so forth and these fines of course come from the overall balance sheet no CEO is paying this fine from their pocket and also some of the CEOs were fired so the leadership itself was unstable there was kind of a musical chairs that was happening in this entire situation so who was the real loser in this situation, nobody. The CEOs would go ahead, find another job. They already made a lot of money and they are not paying out of their pocket. It is coming from the company's account. So the fines were not really that harsh to start with, even when the situation was already going out of control from the last four to five years. Now, how harsh should be the punishment? What they could have done is a completely different discussion, but it is very obvious what they did was not enough. And that is why we are here. To think about it, once again, the shareholders, the retail shareholders are the ones who lost because of these entire inefficiencies by the regulatory system. After 2008 financial crisis, regulators around the world came up with some strict laws and they tried to protect investors, bondholders from coming into these kind of crisis situations. But over the course of time, the regulations were relaxed. And once again, we can see what is happening. End of the day, the people at the top, they remain safe. They might lose a job, they'll go and find another job but it is the retail investors the bondholders and the people without any kind of power are the ones who lose the second important takeaway from this situation is there is real scope for implementation of artificial intelligence regulators can go ahead and implement artificial intelligence algorithms on the banks these algorithms should be able to predict if there is anything wrong that is happening in the bank well initially the algorithms might not do a good job, but over time, the algorithms will learn and it might be able to predict these situations before happening. This is the one clear cut scenario where artificial intelligence will actually save money, jobs for a lot of people. I hope regulators do that as soon as possible. Thank you so much, guys. I hope you have taken away a lot of things from this particular video. Hope this video makes sense to you. Please go ahead, press on that like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Thanks for all the support and I'll see you again in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.